trying to be quiet over there. <laughs> They're rapping. <laughs> Ray, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Of course, of course. How long has it been? What was it like two years ago? 2021? I feel like it was like three because we're in 2024 now, right? Yeah, I don't, don't Long remember. time, long time. I think the Netflix show had just came out. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. It did just come out. And man, you've done a lot since then. Yeah. A lot. There's been a bike build, there's been books, there's been seems like the world tour <laughs> just yeah. going around doing all the stuff that you've been doing. Yeah. How much different is it now than it was three years ago? It's very different. Yeah. Everything is completely different. And it's like and this year I think is gonna be where I cross that line and that I'll never be able to like go back. Go back to that. So that that old bike, you know. Yeah, I yeah. think that's this year is gonna be that year. What, what about it though? Like, what, what do you think that you can say? Like, what do you think that crossover is that what it used to look like and what you think it might look like? Well, since we're already here, yeah. I have a film coming out and we're actually, this is like, you're the okay. podcast I'm telling the world, okay. you know, so I had, nobody knows about this yet. And uh -huh. so we'll start releasing information on it. Um, push it closer. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. Just keep it close. That way it gets it really good. There okay. you go. Um, so I'm going to start telling the world about it now, obviously, uh -huh. but um, we'll start releasing like information on it slowly, like tidbits and stuff like that over the next couple of weeks. Um, but we are in an Academy qualifying festival now. So oh, okay. big things, big things. So I think um, I, I just feel it in my bones that something big is about to happen. I don't yeah. know what it is. But so something. a film film, like an actual like acting film or? Well, it's like acting, but it's not acting. It's kind okay. of a documentary. Okay. In yeah, a yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. It's called Ripple. Okay. And so basically everybody knows my backstory, where I came from, how I got here type mm -hmm. situation, but nobody can, nobody knows the work that I'm doing to continue, okay. like to heal. And, you know, when you're in fight or flight for yeah. so long and then you become safe, yeah, triggers happen. And so doing the work to take care of those triggers, but also like <clears throat> people see social media and they think that. My life is peaches and cream, and it's really not peaches and cream. There's mm -hmm. a lot that the world doesn't know, and this is basically my way of showing the world what my life is really like. Yeah, that's good because I think that we've all been conditioned to only show the highlights of our lives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've said this many times on the podcast. It's just like Facebook taught us not to air all of our shit out there or yeah, not look, laundry. you know, or not look unstable. and. Yep. And what that really, I feel like what that's done is just made us all like hide that shit. And I still don't necessarily want to post about any of the, the woes that go on in my life. But, you know, yeah, that being able to kind of peel back those layers and show people like what, what it's really like to, you know, just exist and then maintain this kind of level of, you know, attention and be creative and be, which... I'm on this scale down here with like what I'm doing. You're fucking on TV and doing all this other <laughs> crazy know, shit. I so mean, we're, it's just different. Yeah. But some of the, I think some of the things are still felt across the board on my end from what I think you deal with sometimes. Yeah. So. I think honestly, like people, I mean, my life is falling apart sometimes and I'm, you know, having to put on a smile and go and do these things and do these school visits and do, you know, all the things that I'm doing, but I have to, it's not that I have to necessarily, but um, in a sense that I think it's okay to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's okay to uh, let your emotions come out and like feel things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we're in a mental health crisis right now yeah, in the, yeah, in the sure. United States for sure. And I think people build these lives and these reputations and they have expectations of being perfect. And so they get lost in you know, trying to be perfect for everybody. And so I want everybody to know that it's okay to fall apart behind yeah. the scenes because eventually things are going to fall together and, yeah. and it's going to be okay. And if a door closes, you know, another one will open and like, mm. you know, you got to plant your seeds for trees to grow. And if you don't plant your seeds then yeah. you know, some seeds grow and some don't. And so you just got to trust which ones and just follow your path. I always felt sense. like if you like using that analogy of planting, I always say a garden, like you never know when the shit that you planted two years ago is going to start producing something or the thing you planted last week. So it's like always, you know, making things or, or networking, uh, you know, keeping looking for inspirations through yeah. other things in the world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Keeps you evolving. And whatnot. well, think about it. Like, really i'm not supposed to be here like i'm not supposed to be doing this stuff like i'm not supposed to be yeah. living this life i mean i am but like i don't know what i did 
to get here, but I must have did a lot of things right and a lot of things wrong in the right areas that just kind of yeah. led me here. So whether you think you are or not, you're setting yourself up if you just trust the path that you're supposed yeah. to go down. I think we have a control factor and we try to control everything. Mm -hmm. And think that we're going to also control the outcome, but we get a very rude awakening that we can't yeah. control that outcome. So just go. I mean, yeah. just do it. Do it with love and your thoughts or energy and whatever you put into the universe, it's going to project itself back. So yeah. just like if you good vibes, good energy into the world, it's always going to come back and where you need it to. And the things that don't work out, sometimes the things that don't work out are Supposed the greatest to. things that ever <laughs> yeah. happened to you, you know? So I've always said that in hindsight, looking at all the like biggest setbacks of my life, they always kind of literally put me in the best position to make, to be in a better spot basically. So, um, yeah, it, you know, it's uh, knowing your backstory. I mean, you talked a lot about it on the first podcast, but <clears throat> you always seem to like, even before the attention started to come, you, you had like a craving to create something. You know what Always. I mean? Whether it was the painting the murals without asking permission yeah. or, you know, getting into all these different spaces that you've, uh, you know, found yourself in. It's like you crave the idea of, of getting what's in your head out into the into the world. And I think that you just did it in the right way. Not it, would you say there's like a little an element of right timing to any of it? Like as far as like the, the not your stuff, but just the attention side of it, you know? Uh, well, I think so. I think timing is everything, but also, you know, the world doesn't know you exist unless you show them yeah, you yeah, exist, yeah. you know? And so I think things are, they happen the way they're supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it, timing really isn't even on our side. It's just oh, yeah. when it's supposed to happen, you know, you just got to trust it and just keep moving forward. If you continue to keep moving, the things that are supposed to happen will happen when they're supposed to happen. Yeah. It's not necessarily like a time frame, yeah. you know, cause like my career, if you would have met me just five years ago, I had just left the fire department. Like I was trying to like just pursue art full time and like just uh -huh. failing miserably at a lot of things. And then just one day, yeah. everything I thought I was failing at, I was really just, working it was at. working towards something greater. And mm. now it's great and it could, it's going to be better. It's going to be even greater yeah. than this. It's just, you just got to trust it. Trust yourself. Fail a million times. Yeah, fail yeah. screwed up. You know, all of those things. So what, what, uh, you know, in your process of doing all the metal, uh, stuff that you've done over the years, like as you've started to dabble in different areas, like, like, <clears throat> is that still like the priority of like the type of art you want to create? You know what I mean? As far as like the metal sculptures and, and all those things that you've done or do, has, is there like an evolution of like interesting other areas that you want to apply your, you oh, know, I want to do everything. <laughs> yeah. I want to do everything right now. I'm after Mattel. That's what I'm after right now is Mattel. Uh -huh. um, trying to get my foot in the door with like more kids stuff. Like the the kids are where my meat and potatoes are. Mm -hmm. I love the kids. I love teaching. I love all of those things. But eventually my hands aren't going to work anymore. Yeah. So I got to leave something else behind. Yeah. And I don't gatekeep nothing. So if you want to learn anything, I'll teach you whatever you want to learn. You know yeah. what I mean? So that way that next generation can do this because mm -hmm. you know the trades and what i'm doing and what we're doing what you're doing it's kind of not, it's not necessarily a dying industry but if we want to keep it alive it starts with them and so mm -hmm. like that's where my heart's at i love the art the art will always be a part of me but you know i'm 38 years old now like i'm not mm -hmm. like 20 anymore you know so like eventually and my hands hurt yeah all the time it affects even sometimes me writing like especially like pulling in yeah. the clutch if it's too hard or like it, it, they just don't work the way yeah. they used to and so you know it's the kids and leaving behind something of value like mm. the book you know and then my next book comes out this year too and this one's a completely different book than the children's book mm. this one's a poetry memoir and mm -hmm. it's called the intrusive thoughts of an influencer because I actually hate the word influencer. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm an influencer. I'm doing something, you know. I'm not just reviewing products or... Well, that that word, that influencer brand ambassador, it gets wrapped up in, in negative conversations. Because the same way, like, millennial is wrapped yeah. up in that same thing, right? Yeah. It's like, it's not really a bad word, but we've associated it 
as a bad word <clears throat> or a derogatory term towards somebody that's doing something. Yeah, and so like that's kind of what this is about. It's like it's to show you the peaches and cream on the outside and then you open it and it's my thoughts for the mm. last 15 years of mm. how very real and human and life like like we're like-minded. Everybody's mm -hmm. the same and we all think those thoughts, we all have those feelings. It's just showing the world that it's okay to think those thoughts and have those feelings and like all of that kind of stuff. So you'll see it. It's like beautiful and then you open it and it's raw. It's mm. real and it's hard and it's deep and hurtful and yeah. all of the things. And so you got to feel those things to get to the other side. And so it's kind of like a process just mm -hmm. like my life. And so every single poem will be from that day in order from oh. what's going on in my life. And so did you just keep like a track of these over the years? They're all, it's just notes and writings oh, yeah. and journals and you know, yeah. never did I think I would ever publish these. So some people are going to read them and know that they're about them, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is what it is. Thank you for yeah. the inspiration and the art, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The muse. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I, I think, you know, I'm not really talking about certain things that I'm trying to do, but the thing, about wanting to make things that, that, that people can hold in their hand, that they can, like, hopefully find inspiration. And I, I hate, like I said, I hate even wrapping even my name or that around that concept of this. I think that, like, just the concept of wanting to create things and for a while working with brands to do things makes makes it easier to get the yeah. message out, get the art out there, or even do the art, you yeah. know, in a sense. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I just, like, I don't know. Like, I... I think that we're all in this place like in the world right now. I think a lot of people that are like tapped into like how they actually feel about shit. They are looking for something more real and tangible and less. I mean, could you imagine the people that like literally uh, associate all their value based on the numbers on an oh app? Oh my God. Well, and you, you know, know, we were just talking about this downstairs yeah. that the internet's not real. Yeah. Like those numbers aren't real. The views aren't real. I'm, it's not real. And so what happens if the internet crashes? What happens if your account gets deleted? What happens after mm -hmm. that? You go back to what? Being a regular person, just yep. like all of us. So I like, I crave this, like leaving something behind outside of that, because if, the internet was to crash or my account was to get deleted or anything was to happen. i still have presence there in the mm. real world of value of physical yeah. likeness that you can hold in your hands and it would stay with the world forever versus just being deleted on the internet. So yeah. it's, yeah, the numbers help the views help those kinds of things. But realistically, like, I mean, before the internet, how did Picasso do it? How did Van yeah. Gogh do it? I mean, Van Gogh, like, created art, and he said at the end of it, like, when everybody hated it and his work was trash, he was like, you know, I created this art for a different generation. And look mm -hmm. at it. Look at it now. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Sometimes the things we do now without social media, even if the world hasn't seen it on the internet, somebody along the line is going to find it. And... Mm -hmm it's going to take on a whole new life of its own. I mean, like how many photographers have like that one woman, there's like a woman, I can't remember her name, but she's like a, she's a photographer and she had all these beautiful prints in her garage or in her house. And mm. after she passed away, they released them to the world. Like, oh, it's just, I didn't know about that. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible that the art is there in the world, but leaving something physical behind is what is really important to me mm. because you know, when I'm gone and I'm not here anymore, I don't want, Everybody to just know the tragic story of Ray Ripple. Yeah. I want all those great things that I did to, to yeah. be to to make that part a grain of sand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then it makes sense. Like all the bad stuff, all the trauma, all the things that I went through. It's not in vain. It's in love because yeah. I'm leaving something yeah. behind for them. You know, I think that like one another thing that we've kind of been dabbling with, I think it really applies here is the concept of and along the lines of <laughs> influence or whatever is it right now, I feel like a lot of people are, and I hate saying that word, a lot of people, but just follow me on this. It's like, I feel like a lot of people are trying to get in the space of being influencers or being this, but they're looking for a place to do it instead of doing something that they love and then starting wanting to show the world that, you know what I mean? Find what you love and learn how to make money on it. Yeah. You know what so I, mean? I feel like you and I know myself with like maybe the podcast is more of a like of showing off things like people like you, you know what I'm saying? Or, or the other people that I've met in this world. But like 
I've painted helmets and customized bikes for 15 years before I started trying to put it on the internet in a way of like, Hey, and I only put it on there to try to sell more of it. But then yeah. with more attention comes more opportunity. Therefore you kind of get drug into this position of being someone on the internet for a while. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or with this podcast, you get drug into this position of being a person that's like trying to show the world people that, you know, I've, I've came across or whatever. So the passion to do something was more of a, a physical, like, um, the, the passion to start showing the people, the world was them just showing mm -hmm. what I've already doing in my life. Not, I want to be an influencer. What, what could I be influencing? What could I use? What could I do? Like <clears throat> that it's like the chicken or the egg thing. Like you, I think that if you want to be real about this shit, then you need to do it from some place of like being real. Well, you know? and you know, there's like a, there's a grave responsibility that comes with also the numbers and yeah. the views and things like that. And like, Example, is, this really hit me hard about like posting what you post and how it resonates with people. And yeah. there's a, a, an, in particular time where there's a little girl that I go into this restaurant locally called Estella's. Mm -hmm. um, I've been there, been going there since I was a tow truck driver. It was yeah. right next door to where yeah. I was driving a tow truck. So I always just walked over or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's a little girl that sits behind the counter because it's a family owned restaurant. Mm -hmm. The waitresses and the cooks and the parents and the grandparents cook and the, yeah. you know, the thing. Everybody runs everything together. And so, like, one day I was, you know, done eating, checking out, and this little girl was sitting behind the counter with her iPad, and she looks up at me, and um, I said, well, first I was like, what are you watching? And she's like, I'm watching um, Frozen. I was like, well, my kids are grown. I haven't seen that. I was like, I heard it's a great movie, though. And then she, like, looked down at, back down at her iPad and then looks up at me, and she's like, I'm really shy, but I'm a really big fan of yours. And I was like, she's like 10, mm. you know, 9 or 10. And I was like, wait you know who I am? And she was like, yeah, I live down the street from you. I was like, you live down the street from me? And yeah. she was like, yeah. She's like, I've been watching you build sculptures in your driveway for the last oh, few cool. years. And I was like, seriously. And it like clicked that like, you know, the responsibility that I carry of what I post and how I say things and how I live my life there. These little girls are watching me mm -hmm. and what I'm doing. And so like when I say there's a grave responsibility, everything that comes out of your mouth will be lingering or hanging on. Somebody's mm. going to hang on to that. Somebody's going to resonate with it and some it's it, or it could affect them badly or yeah. whatever. And so like I don't take my position lightly. I don't take what has been been given to me lightly. And mm -hmm. so like I said what was done in vain it needs to be done in love. And yeah. so like I'm just trying to do the best that I can to make sure that you know I leave love to them and to the kids, that next generation, the next, you know, line of artists and yeah. creatives and all that kind of stuff, because we're kind of, it's kind of pushed out of us as a kid, you know, and we're told that it's not right, or we have rules and obligations in life and adult adulthood we have yeah. to get ready for. And, yeah. you know, so I think, you know, using it for good mm -hmm. instead of just reviewing products, I think is <laughs> the best way to do it, you know? Yeah, not trying to sell something to everybody all the time, you know. And it's it's weird because that's how a lot of us make money. My job is to make great episodes that hopefully you find value in and then you want to support it by or you want to use a brand that I that supports me, right? Yeah. Um but I, I've also like taken like more of a step of wanting to create things more out of uh like to inspire people, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Instead of uh when I say to inspire people, like I want to make podcasts that inspire people. And that's me finding people that have shit to say that's inspiring or that's a, a different way of thinking or a perspective that might not be on the table right now. And so I have to put myself in a mindset of looking for that kind of uh, that kind of content, if you will, yeah, to then put out there so that other people can find it. But then, you know, like I have the, you know, we have the listenership of the guys that want to have hear this girls too, real small percentage, but <laughs> that number is growing. That number is yeah, growing. Maybe. It's growing. One tenth at a time. Hey, so my, even on my side, you know, yeah. like I was looking at my, uh, I don't really look at my insights very much on yeah. Instagram. 
but I noticed I'm almost up to 50% women, 50% men. Oh. That's an accomplishment, yeah. I think, a huge accomplishment, especially because um, when I first started on Instagram, you know, everybody just wants to follow the hot chicks that weld or the hot chicks that do whatever, like, you know, that kind of thing. And I was trying to just break that stigma down as far as, like, I'm just – someone who loves welding, you know yeah. what I mean? And so now women come to my page and it's a safe place, you know what I mean? I don't want anybody to ever feel bad about themselves or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And so I, it's a responsibility of what you're posting and, you know, how you're projecting yourself to the world. It's a, res it's a big yeah. responsibility. And yeah. so, like, having that statistic of, like, half women, half men, you know? It'll grow. It'll grow. It'll yeah. grow. Just give it time. Just give it time. Yeah. The, the, um... <clears throat> Yeah, the process of like all that stuff that you do is is interesting. You know, I uh, like I was telling you downstairs that I have this big <clears throat> urge to want to you know weld. Not so much weld like the way you do, or I, don't, I really don't know all the different ways you do. I know you do a lot of different shit, but I just want to make like shit for cool the things shit. I love, which yeah. is motorcycles. You know what I mean? And there's a there's something that comes in that, and that also leads me into like talking about your build for Born Free last year. And remember, I was telling you, I was like, let's not talk about it. Let's I not talk about, about it. Yeah. Let's talk about it. Um, here. Yeah, no, I'm here for it. I remember when you first got the bike <laughs> and you reached out about painting it. Yeah. Right. And you had this grand idea. And at first I was entertaining it like, yeah, OK, cool. It'd be good to be a part of it. Like, but then I, I kind of. Not consciously, but a little bit subconsciously kind of backed out. I'm glad you did. Because I felt like what you were doing at the beginning was trying to fit Follow the build in the box of what everybody else is doing and what ended up happening. And I think I said this to you at born free is like, I'm glad that you stripped away the need of everybody else as far as like other names to be a part of this. And you found a way to take who you are and build a bike. You know what yeah, I mean? And put I you do. into the bike. So um, when Harley contacted me, of course, I'm not a builder. Yeah. I will never claim to be a builder. Even if I built this, you know yeah. what I mean? I'm still not a builder. And when they contacted me, I was like, man, y'all really dialed the wrong number, you yeah. know, in a sense. But I had this, like, I don't know. I've been a part of this world now for a little while. Yeah. And so, like, I just felt like, all right, I got to keep up, in a sense. And um, it was actually Dan that um, I was telling him about my idea, too. Because mm -hmm. I initially had this whole, like, race bike idea. I was going to put it on 17s, like, you know, turn it basically into, like, a functional street legal yeah. race bike is what I had, you know, badass paint, all of that kind of stuff. And then so I was, like, telling Dan about it. And then, like, a couple of days later, he sends me this text message. He was like, you know, I think they picked you for a reason. You should stay out of the box, mm -hmm. you know. And I kind of thought about it. And then it just came up blank. Like, yeah. Didn't know what I was going to do, how I was going to do it, how I was going to pull it off or any of that. And then I kind of just sat like almost like I was like, oh, well, I'm going to have to give it to him, give it back to him. Because like there's no way I can do this. There's like, not a lot of time either. No, not a lot of time at all. By the time and, you got the bike versus when it needs to be done for, you know, yeah. And I took it to months. frame, like completely yeah. tore it apart. I felt like I owed that to the builder community yeah. too, to just take it completely down to frame and mm -hmm. start from the beginning because... Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. You know, I'm not going to half-ass it. And so when I sat with it for a while, I was uh, at a buddy at Buddy's shop. His yeah. name is Buddy. Yeah, uh, Austin was telling us about it. Yeah, so his name is Buddy, and I was at Buddy's shop. And he just brought out this box of Easy Rider magazines. Uh -huh. And it was an 81 issue, I believe, that I opened it just trying to find inspiration somewhere. Because I think what we we forget that there's an art in motorcycles. Mm -hmm. And back then, every motorcycle was a piece of art. Yes. Every single one. And so I was like, you know what? Like, if I had done it the way that I'd done it, then everybody would have walked up to that bike. Either way, it was going to get shit talked on, you know? So it's just a matter of time. Yeah. But, I mean, people talk shit to me all the time, so I don't really care. <laughs> Keeps me on the algorithms, you know? So, um, but basically, if I would have done it the original way that I thought I was going to do it, um, people would have walked up to him like that. She didn't build that. Like, she didn't yeah. build that. She paid somebody to do it or whatever. So I wanted to give something that when you walk up to it, you're like, damn, that's really Ray Ripple's bike. Like, yeah. it screams everything that I am to down to even the motor, like yeah. little aspects, little de details on it. Like, it just, I wanted it to, 
I'm keeping it. I'm not selling it. I'm yeah. not nothing. I didn't do it so that way I can turn around and flip it and do another yeah. one or whatever. Like this is going to be something that eventually when I'm done cutting up cars and I don't do this anymore, it's going to sit next to that Mach 1 Mustang yeah. that I built the resume for. This is going to sit next to it in a museum long yeah. time from now. You that's, know? A, that's, that's what I wanted to do with my build. I wanted to have something that wasn't going to leave that meant so much to me and I built it for me. And I that's exactly what it yeah. sounds like you did with that. That road glide. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I wanted to be on every single part of it. Every mm -hmm. now, I did almost fuck up the motor, but you know, it was. Oh, it's a great story, yeah. so that's all that matters. But like, even down to like painting, like I got a lot of, I got a lot of hell for like rattle canning it. But mm -hmm. you know, hot rust, rusto mods, hot rods, what are yeah. they? Rattle can, and so I'm trying to make it. I'm. It's mine. And it's mine. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's mine. It's what I want. I ride the hell out of it. And I mean, people love it and people hate it, and, but it's mine and I don't really care. People. That's what choppers are, right? Yep. It's, it's supposed to be like just a representation of you. And I think what, when you talked about the reference of pulling out that Easy Rider magazine, especially in that <clears throat> late seventies, early eighties, there was parts, man, you know, Arlen Ness was making parts, but it wasn't like it is today, No. you know? And so whether you had a part to start with or nothing at all and you had to make these things that's why i think the whole chopper vintage chopper world now that all the people that are in it are so connected to it because of all the innovation or in people's garages with you know not tig welders and shit, just yeah. like you know stick welders and like different stuff making things happen and you know no cnc machines no buttons everything was manual lays Handmade, and mills yeah so I think that it just kind of like ha it does have a different soul to it that I feel a little not. And I've been trying to watch my words with this because I know a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are riding performance baggers, uh, soft tails, dinas. They're into this scene and that scene's dope. And those it bikes is. are amazing. It is. It is. What I'm trying to get at with all them, you know, because everybody keeps saying, oh, Jace is a chopper dude now. I was like, I'm not a chopper dude. I just have an appreciation for what choppers are now. And I want to do me on choppers you know, you know it's i when i went to born free california uh -huh. and just being around i've never really been around this the chopper world like before you mm -hmm. know what i mean i've been around the dyna bros you know yeah, like yeah. for a long time and so like seeing that world it well inspired like yeah. the inspiration that comes from these art pieces which are bikes is like i'm glad i did what i did but it also inspired me to like now i really want to build a chopper now i really want to cut up the whole bike you know what i mean yeah, i yeah. want to have the tank be completely see-through and you wonder where the gas is like i want all of that and that's next it's coming yeah, it's coming yeah. it just start it just started something else to add to the list of things that i do you know but <clears throat> yeah that that whole feeling though like i said it, it like I, I in a perfect world i'll be able to own you know a brand new bike of that kind of caliber and always have it in the stable but the when you make something there like what I use to motivate me through projects for myself is like, like I kind of dream of what I'm going to do on this bike, like where I'm going to be at riding it. Like I, I had so many thoughts of where I wanted to be on that chopper FXR, like in New York city, you know, looking up at buildings that just, you know, pers like to, that come to a, with a horizon, not a horizon, but a fucking perspective drawing, yeah. whatever it is, but just different places, uh, you know, and, that that's kind of I guess the that's that look those visions I get is kind of like the the photography side of me why I love it so like that because I feel like I can I see a muddy version of that in my head and I want to go shoot it like create that somewhere or figure out where that that is yeah um but that process alone just makes it to where you know it feels different and like I guess back what I was saying a while ago about it's not that I'm into choppers and I want to go chase that trend I I want to chase that feeling you it know? is a feeling. It really is a feeling. And the it's crazy. Like, you can go from writing but building something and not knowing how to build it or, like, starting from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. There's, like, such a rush. It's such a rush, and it's exhilarating. It's exhausting. It's, it's all of the things. Yeah. And, like, you know, I build it. Everything I build, I've never built before, you mm -hmm. know? And I kind of took the bike the same way. as like I've never built a bike before, so this is – the opportunity to show the world that I can do this side too. And mm -hmm. 
but also showcase my paint skills and, you know, what my hands can do with a plasma cutter and those kinds of things. Because yeah. that Harley logo that's, like, on the side of the tank, I freehanded that. Like, mm. that's all hand cut. I mean, it took me, like, 14 tries. But, <laughs> like, I finally got them both symmetrical. Yeah. Finally got them both lined up like I was supposed to. It takes a lot of time and just tinkering and, like, you know, failing over and over again in a sense. And so, like... Going into the next one, now I have a whole different appreciation, a whole different feeling, a whole different like dream and goal and where I want to yeah. see it. It's weird how that going we, into the chopper world really does that for you. And building a bike, you know, if 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 you're really going to like I always tell other builders or people that want to build bikes, this, it's like you're not going to build one, you know, just like you're not going to make one art piece. You're not going to paint one painting. You're not going to do any of this. So. Every time you do one, you you gain, you, you get better at what you learned on the last one, and then you learn new shit on this one, and it's this constant evolution of getting better at everything. Yeah. And I've used this analogy before where, maybe it's not an analogy, but this premise, back in the day, you could just build shit, and then you would bring it to the bike show or the Easy Rider show across the town or whatever, and that's the, the first time a lot of people in the world would see the bike. And then they had to hope to get a magazine. So you could fuck up a lot and you can build a lot of bikes and it stays like local in, in a community and it it doesn't spread across the country. Now your first bike is spread all over around the world. Oh, I know. So and the words and the comments and the, yeah. you know, opinions that come with it. It's just, yeah, so people don't, it's out of context that it's the first bike and not that it, it even needs that. It's just the fact that this is the first bike that somebody built and they did it in the public eye. Yeah which most people that are in this current world of building bikes did not have, they had the luxury of some kind of doing it in quiet. Yeah. Yeah. In peace. And you know, it's very nerve wracking for the whole world to think that you don't deserve to be there on that line with FXR division and with, you know, thrash and supply and with Sosa because they've been doing this for a very long time. And maybe I I'm, don't belong right there, yeah. but also I hope that me building that bike, whether people hated it or loved it or whatever, I really don't care. I hope yeah, that it just... Do you think anybody would have turned it down? No. No. I mean... Somebody would have said, you know what, I'm not ready for this. I really hope that people see that, like, because I'm not a builder and I am an artist and that... Um, that you have the capabilities to do anything you want to do. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You just have to put forth the effort and yeah. um, fail and over and over again. You know, I keep talking about failure, but failure is not failure. It's realistically, it's just a redirection into something, you know, planting those seeds yeah. for the trees to grow in a sense. And like, you know, when Harley gave me that opportunity, I was not going to let it fall. And yeah. because, you know, I want somebody else to get picked that isn't a builder too. I want somebody else to get a chance too. You know what I mean? They took a chance on me. I want them to take a chance on other people besides their comfort zone in a sense. And I was definitely not in the comfort zone, I think, mm -hmm. for for them. And so um, I I hope that they do that more. I hope that, that they do that more because they're, we, sh we do need to bring back the art of the motorcycle. And mm -hmm. there's something really beautiful about that. I mean, I, I think that um, the bike, that I built is a Van Gogh moment. It's yeah. before it's time, you know? And I think in the next couple of years, we're really gonna start seeing that art come back. And uh, yeah, that's giving a good point. I feel like that too right now. Like a lot of people started trying to make art for the internet, but I think people are in this, I think artists for sure are gonna look for new ways to make art that's more real and, yeah. and hold it, you know? Yeah. And whether that's paintings, it's like I, I hate the fact that in order to have a nice painting, you got to hold it there backwards for five seconds on a video and then turn, turn around it slow around. and yeah. look like lost in yourself. You like it, you know, and yeah. that's what gets you a million views and gets your art in the world. Like that's yeah. to me, that's like it. That's sad to me. Yeah, I completely agree on that. Like you should never create art for some other people people you should yeah. create it for yourself and i think the initial born free build was i started it because of other people like because i felt like i had to like this obligation to like gain everybody's respect you know what i mean yeah. to be there because i wasn't supposed to be there in a sense and like once uh, i talked to dan and then after that i was like you know what it's me they chose me for a reason mm -hmm. so let's give them that reason of yeah. why they're they are not they're not going to regret choosing me you know what how I mean? was it like working with them 
in the process, like with Harley. Like, oh, they were so great. Mm -hmm. They were so I'm very supportive because you know, like FX Art Division, they have group guys. Thrash and Sway is a group guy. So this is just him, but it was him and his daughter. Mm -hmm. It was just me, and so like I had to like outsource, make lots of phone calls, lots watch lots of YouTube videos. Every single guy that probably watches your podcast, I've probably watched their videos a thousand times. Like, yeah. I never took an MA to part. I, I've never even done any of that ever in my entire life. Like, mm -hmm. I learned so much about the process of motorcycles and the culture that goes into building motorcycles. Mm -hmm. Like, that's like a brotherhood. You gotta, yeah. you know what I mean, in a sense. And so, like, the amount of support that I got from the community was tremendous. Like, yeah. you know, answering every single phone call. Even, like, the, the people that help, like that are a part of it. I wanted all my homies to mm -hmm. be on it, like Chamberlain and, you know, the wheels and the, the exhaust. Like, I wanted everybody to have a piece of the pie, too, to show that also this is a budget build, too. You can do a budget badass build yeah. and it be realistic, you know, because everybody likes to go fast, of course. Everybody likes all the cool, you know, risers and all that cool stuff, you know, but... Not everybody has the the yeah. the resources that the bigger companies with a lot of people um, can can build, and so like I kind of wanted to show too that like this is realistic. This is a realistic build. Mm. Build, you know what I mean? Like I'm not CNC machining things, you know. Like I'm just in the shop, just trying to make things fit together with, with no tape tools. measure, <laughs> no no math, no yeah lathe, no nothing, just. You know, two hands and just a dream. And that's, that's it. But that's like what it, you know, in that process of doing that bike, I was working with Corey from Main Drive. I don't know if you've met him yet. He's Not a, yet. I know who he's he is. He's an amazing but I don't dude. Know who he is. You know, he instilled a lot of wisdom working at his house. He's more than capable of like decking out his house with uh, all the baddest tools, lift, everything. To But I mean, this dude had a drill with a cord on it that looked like it came like a black and decker one for like 1999. It was that old. And I'm like, dude, I'll get you a new drill <laughs> with some like, batteries. No, I no don't that want one it. works fine. Yeah. And I, it, it, I, cause I'm a tool junkie and I'm a, I'm a like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a things junkie. I, I like things. I like uh -huh. cameras. I like fucking, I like the whole shit. I want that. That's the newest <laughs> one, you know, yeah. trying to break that cycle. But he just, he didn't want to lift because he's like, uh, a lot of the old builders, they, they did it on the floor. I want to do it on the floor. Like there was like a soul to the, like how he wanted to do things. Yeah. And that started to instill into me, you know, that inspiration, that, that kind of mindset that I hadn't had before. And that's another part of the, the little bit of spice that started getting mixed into this new way that I'm trying to look at doing things and living yeah. and, and approaching projects. You know what I'm saying? Well, and you know, like I was saying, like, I don't know how to build the things that I build. I just build them. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started this, I didn't have equipment. I didn't have, you know, all of any of it. I just built things with my hands and old school fabrication way. And it's kind of stuck and rolled over into what I am now. And it really shows, I think, a lot in my craft and my work. Mm -hmm. And I have equipment in my shop now, but some of it's not even plugged in. I got it and never even plugged it in yet, you know, because I'm so... I feel like I can do it faster with my homemade tools and my homemade stuff that I've been building with for the mm. last 10 years. I can do it faster with that than some of the other stuff. So yeah. like very old school hands making things versus yeah. tools, which is probably why my hands hurt all the time. But <laughs> <laughs> I need a dedicated person just to rub my hands every single day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, come on. <laughs> Uh, so I'm hiring for that. So if anybody knows, <laughs> are you still getting pretty big commission jobs and stuff like that? It seems like you've you've had a couple roll out the out the gates here lately that I've seen. Um, I'm actually booked out for two years. Damn, that's yeah, good. For two years. How and big so, are some of these things? Oh, they keep getting bigger and bigger. I think it's cool too, and I'm sure you can relate to this. Is like being an artist getting to the point where those commissions turn into what you want to do. Yeah. And that's kind of what they finally turned into is what I want to do. And um, I love the art. Don't get me wrong. But eventually one day I want to get to where I create what I want to create one thing a year, like something massive. And, you know, it sells and goes somewhere awesome. And then I do the next year. Kind of yeah. like a Burning Man, but not doing Burning Man, yeah, you know, yeah. in a sense. Like, because those Burning Man artists, they work on one sculpture all year long. And then the next year they work on that one sculpture all year long. do they burn it, though? Not always. Oh, not always. Okay. No, 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 not always. Um, a lot of them actually get sold to like hotels and oh, okay, things yeah, in yeah. Vegas, and so it's like kind of a double payment because they get paid to build it. And you know, Burning Man seems like it'd be fun, 
If you ever wanted to do it. I d- so um, <laughs> I actually was trying to get into Burning Man uh, in 2019. I was going to work standby as a medic. Uh-huh. in 2020 and then COVID happened so like because Burning Man is like to be an artist you gotta like you gotta like yeah. know people that yeah, know yeah. people that know people that know people that knows this person that knows that person you know and so like a lot of these artists that go to Burning Man they have been doing it for years mm-hmm. and so I, I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of them at the Houston Art Car Parade that was mm-hmm. um last year they brought some of the art cars from Burning yeah. Man and stuff so I, I thought about doing that but then COVID happened and I never got to work standby and then my career and everything yeah. just took off. I just don't have time to be able to sit down to do a Burning Man sculpture yet, yet, but yeah. it'll happen. I want to do, I only want to do it once though, but, mm. um, but as far as like commissions to go, like right now I'm working on a project, uh, called Mexican sugar or oh, it's a restaurant called Mexican sugar and it's going to be in Houston. It's like a five foot by five foot, um, metal chandelier that I'm building and a bunch of these beautiful like Damn. sconces never done lighting before. So I'm doing lighting with this project. And be, then, that's cool to bring that into the metal work, right? Yeah. Oh, well, could you Scared? imagine like the lattice stuff like with lights behind it? So yeah. if I can really figure out that part of it, I could really up my game on mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff. But And then the next one is this massive – this one, I don't know how I'm going to do it. So everybody's going to get to watch me try to figure this out on the internet, yeah. <laughs> on the interwebs. But um, it's going to Buffalo, New York. It'll be dedicated, I think, to the city and stuff. It's going to be built out of some of the bridge material. And so they shipped me a bunch of the bridge material, mm. and I'm going to turn it into this beautiful piano that, lay, like, kind of. Uh, you remember the movie Big with Tom Hanks? Yeah. The piano on the ground. Mm-hmm. So the it's going to go bridge material into this beautiful piano, and it's going to act like the wind is like taking the keys, you know, mm-hmm. up in the air, and there's going to be a hand balancing playing two keys from the top part of the keys where it's coming yeah. up to the bottom on the ground. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but. <laughs> <laughs> Money Buffalo talks, a, bullshit walks. <laughs> a lot of those cities right there in that like <laughs> Buffalo down to Pittsburgh, they're real rusty. So yeah, this one's but gonna metal, be metal, like a lot of metal there. Like I, I rode through it a couple years industrial, ago. Very industrial, yeah, very industrial. And so it'll be really good, I think. And it's gonna be really cool to be. I think for me, it's like I want to be in the Met so mm. bad, you know. But I'm so close, right there. Yeah. If I put that there, it's it's closer to the Met than I'll probably ever be in my lifetime. But yeah. you know, I think just having that it's going to be really cool so and then i'm gonna hoping to try to get that done in enough time to where i can take some couple weeks off in the summer and actually ride my motorcycle yeah. this time <laughs> how how like early days coming into all this metal sculpture stuff did you know that there was this world of it like this i don't know i don't even know how to describe it like what the word would be but did you know that there was a a community of collectors and creators or, I mean, obviously, we all know that there's that out there, but how c- interconnected it seems to be with all these different types of artists and sculptors. and You know, no. I um, So I just really started, I got a Facebook notification, you know, your memories, where, uh-huh. like, it um, tells you, like, what you were doing nine years ago or whatever. Yeah. And, like, just recently, um, well, I went to Arkansas Welding Expo. I spoke to 2,000 kids there. Um, and... Uh, one of the questions I asked were asked about like my early welding or whatever. And I, that day I just gotten a notification that nine years ago that day I was posting on Facebook asking, basically begging somebody to teach me how to weld Mm because I just wanted to take my work to the next level. But then metal art wasn't accepted in the welding community. So the welding art and the the metal sculpture world was completely separate. Mm. So, and somehow in the mix of me welding, I think it's because of me, my tow truck days or whatever that I got, I got in this blue collar industry box of the welding world versus the art box okay. of the welding world. So I'd never met anybody. I, and I live in West Texas, you know, yeah. like there's not, there's nothing like what I'm doing out there. Out there you know? <laughs> yeah. Like there's nothing like that. That's respectable. What I'm doing is not respected out there. It's the oil field, mm-hmm. you know? And so it wasn't until the Netflix show, that I really started to see. I was like, and then I was like being around them too. Like there was a lot of things that I did that I was just like, I would not post on the internet. Cause I was like the welding world would just eat this alive. But then I'm like watching Lou do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, what? Lou's been, how, Lou, how long have you been doing that? He's like, man, I've been doing this my whole like career or whatever, you know? So I got to see that there was like, realistically, 
the welding world is a layer, like different layers. It's like an onion. You got to peel each mm-hmm. layer back. The motorcycle industry is a part of the welding world. But yeah. the thing is, is the welding world has got a bunch of gatekeepers. And so <clears throat> they don't want anybody in that group. It's kind of like saying that Da Vinci isn't a painter because he doesn't paint walls. It's the same instance. Oh, you know? it's what they, it's almost like they're, they need you to do what they do to justify almost their own existence. With yeah. it. Like, well, I'm a welder and I do this. She can't be a welder because she doesn't do this. She doesn't have their certification. She's YouTube yeah. top, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm here to shake shit up in all industries, obviously. Like, yeah. I'm not here to, like, you know, abide well, those, by oh, Those older rules. traditional ways of growing in any type of a trade is almost like it's a lot of it's been controlled through having to get certifications through the years, but there's literally nothing like you can go. Anybody can go buy a welder and yep. go home and try it. Yep. As you know, for a long time, you could not just go buy tattoo equipment anywhere. No. And I think you can now. Yeah, you can. I have a machine. I yeah. had a lot of my whole left arm and my legs are my own tattoos. That's why I look like I went to prison. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like I, I like, I think, Going into the Netflix show and being around these artists and then it just kind of opened up this like art world. Like I felt like, man, there are more. Like you could show more of your stuff to the world. Yeah, and like not care about what the welding world thinks, you Mm -hmm. know, but also to show the welding world that we're all in this together and we're all doing this with or without certifications. I mean, there's some badass artists that will weld circles around pipe welders, you know what I mean? And not just in the, no pun intended, but literally circles. Because, like, if you put, like, a pipe fitter or, you know, a pipeline guy in a room and you put a, an artist in the room that's been welding or has welded and you give them an idea and you say, I will give you $200,000 if you can build me this right now. Uh. The artist will be able to do it, but the pipeliner won't be able to do it because all he knows is to, to do circles. You know what I mean? Or all he to fill that gap. Yeah. Fill a gap. That's it. And so like, even in the industry with the kids, you know, cause I do a lot of school visits. I go to a lot of these kids welding competitions and I see like, you see the coupons and the weld tests as far as like the pipes with these kids and they, who has a better weld, you know what I mean? And it's just literally a strip and, there's probably 500 kids there and every single kid's weld is being rated or graded on. Like, how do you have 500 coupons and how are you going to judge 500 welds? You know what I mean? Like in a straight line, like, right. So to shake shit up, um, I partnered with B and J welding and so welding supply and Snyder, we started, um, a new build off called the junkyard build off to show mm-hmm. these kids that go to these welding competitions that build tables and barbecue bits over and over and over again, or their coupons over and over and over again, that there's going to come a situation or come a time in your life where you're going to be called upon to do something else and you're not going to be able to deliver and you're going to have to pass that opportunity on because you never took a chance to step outside the box. And so this junkyard build off is basically kind of set up in a lot like metal shop masters where like you get a couple of minutes to choose this material. I'm going to give you like a theme or whatever it is. Like last year Mm -hmm. I wanted these kids to build me a mythical creature, but it had to have a story. But the cool thing is about the, the weld part, like testing the welds or whatever. If I pick it up with this jank ass forklift, to bring it up to the front and it falls apart. Are your welds good, certifiable welds? I mean, because you can have these massive sculptures in the middle of a city. And if they fall on somebody, what yeah. happens then? You know, so you have to be conscious of where you're putting the weight, where what's holding the weld there. You know, like it's weight ratio with how much welding, too. And it really yeah, so there's puts, still skill in it. Yep. They're, they're still, still yeah. learning how to weld. They're still learning the the foundations yes yes. and so um doing that really puts these kids that have been welding pipe and coupons at these welding competitions also they're just kids yeah it puts them in a position to be like man whenever they're 25 and they're at this fabrication shop and they've been there for you know five years already when their boss comes to them and say hey we got this project do you think we can do this like man i i I remember this one competition i did in high school i feel like we could do this we Mm -hmm. just gotta finagle it you know what i mean it gives them a even just a smidge of confidence to go into the next thing i had a high school 
welding instructor um, that actually did not take his kids to the competition because he said that it was a waste of time. And so realistically, wow. what did he do? He put those kids in the box instead of letting them figure out for themselves who they are and what they yeah. want to be because there's a realistically a lot of kids in these classes that are taking welding and like um, fabricating or whatever because they really want to be artists because mm -hmm. artists, welding artists are making it okay for them to be seen in the welding world in a sense, you know? Mm. So I want them to, to get a taste of something else besides just pipe and coupons, you know? See, I, as to use as a kind of like a comparison to paint, like when I was in high school, <clears throat> I grew up in a body shop. My dad had a body shop, so I hated paint. But I was still involved with it in high school. And neither of the two places that I ever get exposed to custom paint. It wasn't till I left high school, decided to not pursue painting. I wanted to be a mechanic. And so I, you know, I worked at Walmart changing oil because I wanted to work with tools and take Learn. stuff out. And then uh, I got a the Walmart thing. That's that so funny that you worked at Walmart doing yeah. that because I started, like, I was in this interview. I don't mean to interrupt, yeah, but yeah. I was in this interview and this lady was like, where do you think all this stemmed for, from? Like, where do you think it started? And we were like, just in conversation like, and go all the way back. I actually was making cakes at Walmart. For real? Yeah, I made cakes at Walmart. Like, those, like, yeah. elaborate cakes. And I always kind of got in trouble because I always put more <laughs> into it than what... Uh, they were paying for yeah. in a sense because I wanted to make them great. So it's crazy how you started like in a sense in Walmart and dabbling yeah. in this world. And I did too. <laughs> how funny well, is that? The, the way I, I felt like it's like I wanted, I'm not a mechanic, yeah. but that's the close, that's something I know I can do, but I can still touch a tool. Mm -hmm. And you know, you learn how to get stripped out drain plugs out of cars, yeah. you learn how to get stripped all, out, uh, you know, um, lug nuts off of things and I was the guy not the manager but the guy that could solve every problem in that in that place yeah. and I was like and so I learned a valuable lesson in that but when I got the job wet sanding at a motorcycle shop you know that's I literally walked in and I'm like I, I knew that at this point I had seen it but I never like we were saying I've never seen it done yeah so once I started seeing it done I'm like oh I, I know I can do that I know how to paint this I, I can paint that tank black I can buff it that's how you lay out flames. Okay, cool. So if I would have seen that in high school or there would have been some guy like me that comes and talks in high school about the opportunities in custom paint or, or these other things you can do, then I feel like it would have been something that like out of those 20 kids that might be sitting in that class, maybe one or two are like, yo, like this is, I'm interested in this. And the other, you know, 18 don't give a fuck. Yeah. That's still two more kids that might get a better head start. Cause that's one of the things I used to like, not would say hate, but I was like, man, I wish I would have found this at 15 instead of 21. You yeah, know? I could, like how much further we'd yeah. be in life had had not chased love and chased yeah. welding, you know, in a yeah. sense. Um, I, I was just talking to my local high school uh, about this as I um, so I got a new CNC machine and I gave them my old one, of course. I uh -huh. never actually felt like that one belonged to me anyways. I always felt like it belonged to Mr. Woody, you know? Yeah. And so um, we were setting it all up and we were done for the day. And like it was in between classes, like the kids were all at lunch. So it was just like me and him in the classroom. And he um, I've been working with his class for probably like five years, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, when I first started working with his class, he was all coupons, all pipe welding. And the amount of artists over the last five years that has transpired mm. from his class to where now his room is filled with artwork. And mm. um, a lot of the stuff he teaches now is artwork. And he said, you know, Ray, I'm really glad that you are here. I'm really glad that you are show you're showing me this world because this would have never happened without you here. And I was like, Mr. Woody, this is all you. This isn't me. You're the teacher here. Yeah. I just show up every once in a while and be the cool guy, you know. But, like, this is all you. You allow them to have a space to create instead of putting them in the, in the box. Yeah. And so, like, and then you start sifting out who's serious and who's not serious, who's there for the credits and who's there for the art and who's yeah. there for what's going to happen next in their life. And it's incredible mm -hmm. when teachers feed the creative side instead of putting them in the box and the rules that society and life gives mm -hmm. us. The things, the beautiful things that these kids' hands create yeah. is in, insane. Like, I, you can go to state. Like, these yeah. kids will take these yeah, sculptures Bikla, to state. Or Bika? 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 Bika, Bika yeah. What is Bika? Bika. It's like a, voca it's like a vocational thing. I, that, that's what I did in Texas. 
for like architectural stuff? Uh, I. It's I've like never Vicka, heard of that. yeah. I've so never it's, heard of that. I, it might be some. We're talking. We the have 90s. like the we have like the Texas High School Welding Series, okay, and like yeah. all of that kind of stuff. So it's like, not like a, all the all the trades thing, like a woodworking, a cosmetology. A, a, no, but so, I feel like we should bring that back. I'm so we would that have that thing. Really it was called Vicka, and basically, eat like every high school that was you know able to have you know all these different vocational classes within <clears> it would do like a like a a state competition mm-hmm. and then there was a regional like a, a national competition so like for drafting we would make our own plans for a house and i worked at a fucking architectural office so i was able to use a lot of the pre-made mm. like i can i designed the whole thing but i already have like all the cutouts for the walls and how it's going to be bolted so i can just paste in and yeah, print paste. this stuff out so it's like my shit was pretty professional looking yeah i got kind of far in it but there was always someone a little bit better that got, you know, ended up going out bigger, but you'd also have like a, a competition of like showing your plans and then you'd have a competition sitting at a computer to do a project and the most efficient and fast would mm-hmm. be the person that would win. They or, do that with welding, like the yeah. welding competitions, but they've opened a lot more up into the sculpture world and really yeah, being yeah. accepted. And like these kids are using like copper, they're using like mixed metal materials. Like some of these kids Five years, they're going to surpass anything I've ever built, which yeah, is yeah. the most incredible feeling in the world is seeing all of this become more accepted into into the blue you, collar industry. If you look what happened with the tattoo culture in the mid 2000s, where there was so much gatekeeping and tattooing, which <clears throat> as knowing guys like Oliver Peck and some of these old, old guys, like there's a part of it that I agree with. And there's a part of it that like I still, you know, like the fact that when other real just artistic people in general started taking to tattooing it catapulted the the quality of tattooing times 100 yeah 100 you know 100 and so now it's like you have so many amazing tattoo artists that don't look or feel like those ones that you used to see back in the day but like i said i you know i i know a lot of those old guys and there's something kind of magical about the art they created a long time ago because it's almost like a dying style now in some aspects because everybody's so everything's so crisp and new that like sometimes having like a nice little Texas logo banger from, you know, one of the old guys is a pretty cool thing to have on you. You know what I mean? Oh, I love old school tattoos. I mean, look at my body. Like, I mean, I don't really care what goes on (laughs) in a sense as far as like a permanent tattoo goes, you know, I, um, so dabbling and tattooing, like I tattoo cars basically. And so like I picked, I picked tattooing up. Now, I'm not trying to say, like, I'm a professional or, like, I can get hella into shading and create mm-hmm. you, like, a masterpiece portrait, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? But if you need, like, a good stick stick figure or, like, a smiley face on a toe, like, I got you, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, like, as far as, like... When I picked it up, it yeah. was because my tattoo artist, we were doing my leg into my butt, mm-hmm. this part. So we had been there for forever. And then I was like, man, it just hurts so bad. He goes, I don't feel a thing. And I was like, of course you don't, because you're not the one that's getting pins and needles. But he has like such a heavy hand. Yeah. And so after we were done, he was like, you want to try it? And I was like, on you? And he was like, yeah. I mean, I've been tattooing you for years and we're best friends, you yeah. know? And so I tattooed free hugs on him and cause he had one that said warrior. So he put warrior on me and I put free hugs on him and it was a sensation that was the exact same as plasma cutting. Mm. And so once I bought a machine and some ink and some from somebody that would let me have some ink, yeah. you know, cause like there were so many orders that I was trying to order ink from and they just, uh, if you didn't have some sort of certification or certificate or yeah. something, they couldn't process your order, but that's what we have Amazon for. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a, I got a machine and some ink and I just started tattooing the insides of my legs and on the tops of my legs. And it just started looking like the cars, you know, mm-hmm. like the style is the exact same in a sense. And so like, if you're looking for lattice work on your leg, let me know. But um, <laughs> so I I fell in love with it, but yeah. I would never do it and try to be a professional or like take money for it or anything. But if you want like a cool party favor, like I'm totally <laughs> cool to bring in. Let's just that's, tattoo toes together, you know. That's a good. That's a good like thing about like being someone that's really interested in a lot of different types of art and wanting to try it. It's almost like I do want to respect the people. I want to pay respects to the people that's dedicated their lives to being that. So it's like I always I've been trying to 
as I get in these circles, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm here as a student. I'm not trying to learn what you know so that I can just go and do it cheaper. Or it's not, it's not really even about money. It's mm -hmm. like, I just want to know how to do this because I'm interested in it. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe it could be that. Maybe it could be the rest of my life doing this. Or maybe it can be that next stepping stone into the next thing that this is going to move me further down the path to the next thing that it's going to might be seed. that, you know, Plant the seed for the, tree to grow. It's the uh, like the concept of wanting to make another exhaust. It's like, I would kind of like your party favors. I would like to be at a point proficient and skilled enough making an exhaust that I can make some for my, me, my friends and things like that. Nice. But I'm not trying to put out, this is the fast life dynapipe. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know? Like have your own, like no, try I don't to want take it. Yeah. I, completely I, I want, I, I, I like the idea of everything that I offer is a one off thing mm -hmm. from me. Yeah. I don't, you know, how many people have told me you should take a helmet yeah. and just have it reproduce and then sell a bunch of those. Like then it doesn't have any soul. There's anymore. no value left in it. Like, yeah. the, or I mean, I feel like it loses value in a sense doing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I completely. So the, the only thing I ever did that was even similar to that is I did a, a helmet series of five helmets, the same graphic, but they could pick their own colors. Oh, and there was one of five. Oh, that's badass. So I like that aspect because then I could like do something that's like, I've already figured out a hard part and then everybody can kind of add something of their own to it so it's still unique yeah um but i just like the idea of making something and it's like if i had to make the same thing every day over and over and over again i think i would go crazy lose interest yeah so quick well also too i know my boundaries like i'm not trying to be i'm not trying to step on your toes because i'm not trying to even say that i'm like remotely as good as you are tattooing mm -hmm. or as good as you are in anything, even really even welding. Like I'm a shitty welder. I just hide it in artwork. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I'm not trying to compete or say I'm better than anybody by any means, but I think it is a, it's a great space to be creative in all ways because mm -hmm. it really inspires your actual craft. You yeah. know what I mean? So, so I get it. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's the plan, man. A lot of, a lot of interesting things. So the, you know, kind of going back to your, like, show the documentary coming out like how does that work like how like what was it like filming something like that you know oh it was exhausting not in a bad way mm -hmm. but um so i actually met joe Dax and michael and like the production staff like all the people that mm -hmm. um i worked with on this film I met them on a, the Northern Tool commercial. Okay. You remember when we were sitting we were at, at the restaurant? Yeah, yeah. That and was literally, Tool. that never happens ever in real life. Yeah. Like, I tell everybody about that story because I hadn't seen it on TV. And it just so happened to be, like, that movie moment where you're, like, sitting at the restaurant with all your homies. And you're, like, on the TV on the background. Like, that was pretty cool. I'm not yeah. going to lie. But, um, so when I was filming that commercial... Uh, I met these guys and like we just became homies, like mm -hmm. basically family. And so at the time, now I can talk about this now because I don't have an NDA signed anymore. But um, at the time after that was done, uh, that Hot Wheels show, um, thank God I never did it, but that Hot Wheels show that. Weren't you going out. to Europe for yeah, that? Yeah, I was going to go to the yeah. UK. And then, of course, like things happened. The contract was not that great and like other things. But um, but also my career, I really shouldn't couldn't leave mm -hmm. in a sense for that long to film the show. So when um, I initially started looking into the show, it has to do with like the union, like the actors union. And at the time, like everybody was like fixing to go on strike and like there was like mm -hmm. other things going on, too. But um so the show was like a union job or whatever. And there's a lot of people in the TV world or like the film industry that look constantly push you to go to the union, mm -hmm. you know, to join the union. And so I called, you know, Michael and I was like, hey, like, what is your take on the union? You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. then that phone call lasted like hours and I ended up basically somehow we just talked about my whole life story and like what I'm doing and like all that kind of stuff. And he was like. I need to film you. I need to film some. There's something here. I don't know mm -hmm. what it is. I need to film it. And so that last January. Mm. So they came last January. Yeah, that was right. Because we that dinner and that hang was in December, not last December, but the December before. Yep. Yeah. So. Yep. And so they came in January and stayed filmed. Um, I think um, and then I don't really talk about my dad very much. Mm -hmm. And it was weird how the universe works is like for some reason this was this mm -hmm. was that moment in my life and there was like a lot of things that really made sense and that um 
I'm a person that likes answers and mm-hmm. I will literally chase the answer until I die, until I get it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to have an understanding and a meaning to everything. If there's no meaning to it, like I will find it. You yeah. know what I mean? And it made 10 years worth of questions, my whole life worth of questions, things that I had never had answers to. It gave me so many answers. And so like, in a sense, when people see this, like the process of doing the filming and and opening up to the thing. Yeah. Just the filming, uh, the powerful things that happen and things that happened 10 years ago that I didn't understand and been searching for answers. And it's the 10 years is, it's, I mean, my whole life, obviously, but there's something very specific about this 10 years ago trying to figure out a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And it was weird how everything made sense just while they were there. Mm-hmm. And, like, it just put those that gap. It closed that gap. And so when you see it and when the world – if you want to see it, I can give you the password and you can go yeah, watch, I definitely it. watch so it. It's yeah. very heavy, so just fair warning. It is yeah. a very heavy film. But – um it just closed that gap. And at that time, um, I was also really struggling with the being safe and not yeah. being in fight or flight and the triggers that come with that, like weird things like a, a closet light being on were triggering and yeah. it's not, that's not me, you know what I mean? And so I'm in therapy and I advise anybody that's not in therapy to seek therapy, not because you're crazy, but because we are crazy and we really <laughs> need somebody to talk to sometimes. Yeah. And so in therapy, like just talking about it and um, bringing it up, she was like, I really think I really feel like he needed to see somebody else, too. And uh, so she sent me to a psychologist that is basically uh, he deals with only like soldiers and Mm -hmm. um, PTSD in soldiers. So Mm -hmm. I was his first child abuse yeah. like patient and so doing a lot of the rapid eye movement stuff and yeah. but still keeping up with regular therapy too and so it really put a lot of things into perspective of rewriting narratives mm-hmm. in ways that nobody taught me how to do but also that none of this is my fault and that I don't have to carry the responsibility of what everybody else has done mm-hmm. in my whole life that's all I've been doing and so yeah. like taking the steps to figure out what that is within me it really, honestly, filming this truly has changed my whole life. And oh. even if it doesn't do anything or go anywhere. It's still worth it, yeah. It was worth it just because, like, there was a lot of things I was holding on to that I would never talked about, never even told the world, and, like, never nothing. And I just, I finally faced them. You know, it took a long time, but I finally faced them. And, like, now I understand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Now I understand that realistically we think that bad things happen out of vain and really it's your it's your job to rewrite that narrative to turn it into something yeah. loving. And so like that's why I do all the things that I do. That's why I push all this stuff out. That's why I give the world what I, I give them is because, you know, it's very important to me that it, my whole life wasn't out of vain. Mm-hmm. That it was out of a place of love. And mm. not just that, but so my dad who's out there, yeah. who sees it, knows that he didn't break me. You know what I mean? And he didn't break any of that part of my life. And so that's important. And I think everybody needs to see that. Everybody needs to feel that because we live to live up to this expectation that we have to be perfect yeah. and that we can't fall and we can't, you know, feel these things. And it's okay to feel these things. It's okay to be lost. It's okay to feel like you can't get out of bed that day. Like give yourself the day. If the only thing you have to find something to keep going, Mm -hmm. even if the only thing that day is a cup of coffee, like to get out of bed, to get a cup of coffee, to go back to bed, give yourself the day, go Mm -hmm. to bed, spend the whole day in bed, then wake up. It's a new day. It's a whole new thing. Take it on that day. And if that day it's a cup of coffee, then that day it's a cup of coffee too. I think it's just about being patient with yourself and your brain and your heart and your soul. Yeah. And allowing your body to rest too. But also when you're in fight or flight and your nervous system is heightened for so many years, the people confuse the rest with depression. And sometimes your nervous system just needs rest and it shows up as depression. And I don't think it's necessarily that you're depressed. It's maybe your body and your heart and your soul just needs a little bit of rest in a sense. And so allowing, changing that narrative. Yeah. Into. So did you get that through the, the filming and because of the more PTSD uh, type of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Like it just changing that narrative to realizing that like, 
it's not necessarily depression. It's just being tired. You're yeah, tired. Yeah. Your body's tired. And even though your brain doesn't remember, your body always remembers. <laughs> and so um, learning, yeah, for real. And once you feel that, then you can get through it. You have to like... You have to, to get through it, you have to get through it. You have to feel everything within mm -hmm. that moment of getting through it to come out on the other side. And I think people don't want to feel it. Mm. And so they just think that it's the other side and they skip all the things and then you don't do any of the work and that's where it catches up to you. And it hits you really hard in the brain and the heart and you can't let go of those feelings and then they overtake you and then it becomes everything you are. And then mm. eventually, you know, I think that's why we're... And such a, like, we're losing so many amazing people in the world that have this expectation that they're not allowed to feel or feel vulnerable or whatever, but also that they can't go through it. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, sometimes you have, I mean, look at Britney Spears, 2007, Britney Spears, when she shaved her head. Was it 2007? Yeah, somewhere around somewhere there. Somewhere in there. Well, when she shaved her head, I mean, she was really going through it. She was really feeling it. And I know that she's batshit crazy now, but I love this whole, like, <laughs> I love following her on Instagram because she's literally don't care. Yeah. Like, she doesn't care anymore. She felt it, went through it, and now she just... She doesn't care. Yeah. She doesn't have to answer to nobody or talk to nobody or whatever if she doesn't want to. And, like, you have to get to that point yeah. to just get through it, you know, and in a sense, if that makes sense. But oh, it does. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the the I, I feel like a lot of, you know, or, or let me ask you this. Do you do you feel like you found other ways to mask those things like to get you through it? Was it like the work ethic that you started having to kind of keep your mind on other things? throughout the 10 year span, because that 10 year span is kind of like this foundational period to who you kind of are now, you know what I mean? All these skills and, and whatnot you've built for yourself. Um, some people choose alcohol, some yeah. people choose drugs. Um, I think work for me was always my drug of choice. I think, yeah. um, if my mind is busy building something or trying to figure it out or how to make it work or whatever, you don't really have time to think about anything else. Well, yeah. you know, so I always, my drug of choice has always been work, which isn't healthy. It's just yeah. as bad as the bad stuff, you know? And so you have to take a step back. And I think the last couple of years too, cause like my health kind of started deteriorating too, in a mm -hmm. sense, because I wasn't paying attention to my body. You know, your mind forgets, but your body remembers. And so my body was remembering a lot of things. And so you really have to kind of take a step back to rest. You know, you got to let yourself rest. And mm -hmm. so like taking off at 530, shutting my shop door at 530, you know, having dinner with my kids, you know, making dinner with them, talk, the conversations we're having in the house and just being together, like taking that time to just mm -hmm. step away and rest with them is very, very important, you know? Yeah, they're getting pretty old, aren't they? Yeah, 20 and 15. Yeah, that's uh, it's pretty close to mine. My, my son's about to be 14 and my daughter's 22. Yeah, so. I love it, though. I love it. They're like yeah. best, for, like the best friends you always wanted, you know? Yeah. You can tell all your secrets to them. They'll never I, tell anybody. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it. you know, my daughter, um, I'm... I'm very fortunate that she's got the head on her shoulders that she has, but I'm a very, I'm a very overpowering dude sometimes with like, are you sure you're doing it that way? Are you, you know, you should be doing this or whatever. And I don't want to be that. So I've kind of just take a step back. I take, you know what I mean? Like I want to be involved, but also when she starts telling me certain things that I want to like, Fix or fix control for, or yeah, yeah then I, I, I find a way of like kind of pushing myself away from it. Not that I don't care, mm -hmm. but because I don't want to take away her ability to, to like feel who, you know, live that moment and, you know, get her own shit from it. You know, but I also don't want to be there to save her every time she keeps making dumb decisions, which she's only made like one so far yeah. as an adult that I'm like, not really? dumb, but kind of like, yeah, like, you know, really? come on, dude. Like one of those moments. Yeah. yeah. I think. You know, I, my parenting style has gravely changed over, you know, the whole course of their childhood in a sense. My ultimate goal was to give them a childhood they didn't have to recover from in a sense. Yeah. Um, but I used to be, I think it's also to your environment. Your environment also plays a role in your parenting and how yeah. you parent it. Um, 
a long time ago, back when I was working two full-time jobs or driving the tow truck and I was gone and, you know, just chronically working. That's all I did was chronically work. My parenting style was, Chloe, you got to go to college. You got to get a degree. You got to go do something really big with your life because if not, you're going to be driving a tow truck like me and I don't want that. And, you know, like, and for men, um, it's really easy to go get a high paying job with no education and make good money. You know what I mean? But for women, it's really not. It's like, we really have to, push the boundaries and prove ourselves to get to that point. And so like at that point in that mindset, Mm -hmm. I would push college, 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 college. And then I quickly realized while Chloe was in high school, cause she was the cheerleader. She was, you know, all of those things. And then, um, she has some health problems. And so, um, she was in the hospital a lot, pulled her from school and ended up just homeschooling her the rest of her high school career. Like it really, put that perspective that like I I was pushing what I thought was best for her, but I forgot that both of these kids are their own humans. They have their own wants, they have their own needs, their own dreams, their own desires, their own everything, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Just like us, right? So mm-hmm. to give them a space to explore what that looks like for them with guidance instead of telling them what to do versus you know before i would tell them what to do all the time now it's more guidance like you ask my advice i'm going to give you the pros and cons and then you have to make that decision for yourself but also like supporting your own decisions that's a big big thing in our house is like when you make a decision you have to support that decision because you made that decision for a reason whether it's a bad outcome or a good outcome that comes at the end of it you better support that decision, you know? Yeah. My daughter shaved her head, and then she, like, after she shaved her head, she, like, hid for a while, and I told her before she shaved it, I'm not buying you wigs. I'm not nothing. You support that decision. And the woman that she turned into, it was that moment of her shaving her head that really transitioned to, like, I was forcing her to be in a box that I thought was best for her because of what I came from. Mm-hmm. And so when she shaved her head, which I got to shave it for her, which was a very powerful moment. She's probably manic at the time, honestly. But when she shaved her head and I got to watch her transform and really learn who you are, like who she is. I mean, because we as women, we hide behind our hair. I mean, look how long my hair is. I, I definitely hide behind my hair here, but... She couldn't. She had nowhere to hide. She really had to feel what she was doing in her life and like all the decisions that she'd been around and stuff like that. So she, um, the woman that she transformed into now, I see who she was supposed to be the whole time. You know what I mean? And although she's made mistakes and although Cash has made mistakes, they learn from them. They supported those decisions, even if they were bad decisions, and we moved on. And so a lot of people think my relationship with my kids is actually kind of weird, which is kind of funny. But I think the non-relationship that other people have with their kids, that's weird to me. You know what I mean? Like, I have always wanted the family. Hell, I actually didn't even want this life. I wanted to be like... 19 kids and counting you know what i mean i wanted to have enough kids to have two bands in case one sucked and you know the other (laughs) one was good you know i wanted this huge family i wanted lots of grandkids and you know their their spouses and you know their families to all merge together into this beautiful made-up world that i thought yeah would happen but you know i very quickly learned that life doesn't work like that and sometimes some people have big families and sometimes it's just you, Chloe, and Cash, you know? And yeah. so and that's not always a bad thing. And I think it goes back to, you know, the mental health of this stigma of not being able to feel things and feeling like we have to have this box. We have to fit in this box of what everybody else has told us it's got to be. It's the same way with family, which is why we all feel so alone and lonely and yeah. because we don't have that support and what we think that we need, but really we just support ourselves and the kids are learning that too because I'm not going to be here forever. And Chloe's a lot like me. Her dad ran out on her. And I had her when I was 17, you know, yeah. so she doesn't have the dad. She doesn't have none of that. Now, Cash is opposite. He's got his dad and his whole family, you yeah. know, so he has a massive family. But on holidays, when he goes to his dad's for, you know, to celebrate, it's just me and Chloe at the house. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, like, Making sure that Chloe is a strong woman. Yeah. So that way she doesn't chase the love and she doesn't chase the mis- the mistakes. She doesn't chase any of that mm-hmm. for validation. She's so strong that she doesn't need nobody. So when I'm not here, I know 
Yeah. She can yeah. take care of herself. But also, it's her brother's job to watch after her, you know? So, like... That's good that they're close, you know what yeah. I mean? So. Oh, yeah. We're all peas and carrots here. <laughs> it's rad. I think that... So, when do you think the documentary is going to come out? Uh, so... Because you said it's going to some festivals first, right? Yeah. So, um, it, it's uh, it's going to go to some festivals first. Um, I think we're going to start releasing... I don't... There's, like, a world premiere of the trailer that's going to come out. After mm. this is done, I'll show you the trailer so you can okay. see it. There'll be a world premiere of the, the trailer, but um, we'll start releasing information on it soon. So that's cool. behind the scenes and like cool things. So, so after you put it through the festivals, is it it's like sometimes get picked up by like other like maybe distributors things through that? Or how does that work? Well, like if uh, a, like if a Netflix or a, an Amazon. That's or, the hope. That yeah. I think um, the initial goal is like I want a featured film. You know yeah. what I mean? I would love for a featured film to take place. I feel like there's layers there and I feel like that's. It could. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, honestly, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know where it's going to go. I've never done anything like this before. So, like, I feel like it'll either, it's going to be great either mm -hmm. way. Even if it's something I take to schools and show it to schools and then, you know, keynote speak, yeah, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. It'll, it's going to do what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, so. that's good. That's I think that's a good per perspective to have because, you know, wanting to create something but not leveraging its value to you based on what it could provide for you yeah that's the that's the other part of like being an artist that i've actually had to don't learn to don't do. put all your eggs in the same basket yeah, you know? i did this because i wanted to and i have to be content with nothing coming from it yeah you know but i hope that people find it and they love it and it does something for them but if it doesn't i still enjoy it and i still love this thing like well, I mean, I think grand scheme of things, the yeah. outcome, I think it would be great for it to be a feature and like, you know, big, big, big things come from this. Not necessarily because like of the fame and the money or material things, because it's never been about that for me. It's been yeah. about I hustle to disappear. Like that's what I'm hustling for. So yeah. I can disappear in the woods somewhere and then come out with a sculpture and five years and everybody's like man i thought she died like no we're still here <laughs> you know those kinds of things like i i'm doing it so i can start setting the generational wealth for my kids yeah. and for my grandkids and for my great grandkids and for whatever the rest of my line because this is the the cool thing about my life and that changing the narrative and rewriting the perspective is i didn't get the mom and dad in the big family Mm -hmm. because I was chosen to create a whole new family, a whole mm -hmm. new generation, a whole new everything. A bro like I broke the cycle. And so it's my job to set that, keep that same tone for every generation that comes after me. Like I, that's my responsibility. That's mm -hmm. what, that's why I do it. I do it for that generational wealth for them, but also so Chloe and Cash will never have to worry about how their electricity bill gets paid. I mean, it's the same thing as yeah. two years ago, three years ago when sitting here like, they should never have to feel what that feels like. Yeah. And they have already felt it because, you know, I'm a single mom and my own life choices because we all make mistakes. But um, going forward, they'll mm. never have to feel that for their children and their families. And that's the ultimate goal is to create that life for them, you know? Yeah. To give everybody jobs. That's my... My goal is to give everybody around me a chance and a job and success and love and like to be able to live the life that you want to live because realistically, like if we're lucky, we get what eighty years maybe yeah. on this planet and like if I, you're not in the trades. <laughs> no, yeah, for real. But yeah. like, I mean, we get we don't get a lot of time. Yeah. And after we're gone, it's just a speckle of dust at that point. You know what I mean? So I gotta we gotta leave something of value, you yeah. know, behind in the world and. That's well, you're I definitely doing it. I think. Uh, so are you. I mean, yeah, I'm trying, so you. you know, whatever that ends up being, you know, it is what it is. But it, I am trying. I am trying to figure out what that is, whether it's just a mark on this motorcycle industry mm -hmm. or scene or you know, le or the legacy of motorcycles. Or the, or any, all of it. Whatever it is. It, yeah. Um, you know, that would be an honor, at least for, you know, my kids like, oh, well, my dad was somebody here. You know, maybe it might not be the. It might not come with a big bucket of money and a couple properties, but if it does, that'd be rad, you know? Um, but if not, maybe like you said, how you're changing the narrative for your family, you know? 
So. Yeah, you know, and Cash yesterday, like, sometimes I, like, pity me because I'm like, oh, my God, I can't call nobody and tell them this great news and, like, whatever. So I, uh -huh. I do that. I do fall into that mindset sometimes because, you know, it would be nice to be able to have somebody to tell all your good news to, you know. And so yesterday before the O'Reilly's event, because um, I was here for this leadership conference or whatever, they invited me out to be mm -hmm. a, a special guest for their uh, managers and their district managers and stuff. And so before, because it was later in the evening, so before I was on FaceTime with Cash, and sometimes I'll just sit there for a couple hours. We'll sit there for like an hour or two hours in between, whatever, and mm -hmm. I'll just sit there with them. Even if we're scrolling on FaceTime and not really talking, we're just together, and that's all that matters. And mm -hmm. so like right before I got off the phone, I was like, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to take a shower, I guess, and start getting ready or whatever. And he was like, well, you go walk in that room, and you light it up, Mom. And I was like, what'd you say? <laughs> Like immediately, he was like, yeah, he was like, you walk into the room and you just light it up. And like it immediately made like, see, like already yeah. my eyes are just like want to cry. But um, <laughs> that's why I do it for them. You yeah, know, that's right. For that moment of like they see it. They got to see you succeed, you know, in a sense, too, like as parents, we're very we're very not selfish people because, you know, we got to think about them first. But mm -hmm. sometimes you got to think about yourself first, because if you don't think about yourself, you can't be what you need to be for them. Mm -hmm. And so um, doing all of this uh, is they know it's for them, you know, and they know that all of it is a sacrifice for them. And they're seeing it now, which I love because they're older. But when they're younger, it's like, Mom, you're always gone. You're always da -da -da -da. I'm like, I promise it's for better good. Just be Mom's patient. A rolling stone. Yeah, just patient is all it is you know yeah. well that's that's dope man I'm, I'm i'm happy for you and it's it's uh you're really good at like um just being open with the world about how you're evolving and changing and moving so we're lucky to have you out here doing the the lord's work yeah, i don't know about <laughs> that i think it's just more people need to speak up you know yeah i think if we had more people to speak up and just talk about the very real things that are happening in their yeah. own lives you know it could i think it's yeah that's kind of yeah or, or find you know speak or, or speak through the the ways that they know how to you know whether that is art you know you know you're you're doing this documentary helps you speak you know find these answers yeah so the art of creating something helps you through that you yeah. know so if people, you know, are feeling so lost, maybe they should start looking for a place to apply that thing. Like you said about, you know, you know, just f fucking do something, make something. Well, you know, Try. I, I go I bake, go fucking, you know, go sweep the garage, you know, go sweep the house, mm -hmm. start moving, start, you know, doing something. And I don't know. I have this, I have this theory that the only skill that we're born with is creativity. It's just something that happens in life that allows that to come out. And some people it never get that chance mm -hmm. to have something just happen to where it finally just vomits out of you, you know, mm -hmm. in a sense. And so um, I think I think everybody is a creative. And if we spent more time trying to tap back into that, mm -hmm. I think that's where like, everything comes together, you know, yeah. in a sense, I guess. <laughs> You know, I do, I do agree to that a hundred percent. Yep. Cause sometimes you see people that'll do something like my, my kids, for instance, like I might not see a creative side in my son, but then he'll do something like, Oh, I didn't know you, you had that in you. Yeah. You know? I, but you know, like both my kids are like little artists, you uh -huh. know, but they don't, they don't feed it. Yeah. They don't feed it right now. They're like, and I can't be that person that's like, do it, you know? Like, I want them to create just because, mm -hmm. you know, that's the artist to me. But, like, I have Chloe's paintings all over my house, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And Cash draws me stuff all the time. But he's a computer nerd, so he does a lot of stuff on that's the computer, That's right. I remember y'all talking about that. <laughs> yeah, he's a computer nerd, so he does a lot of computer stuff and whatnot. But, like... He's yelling, uh, yelling at the other kids on the games. Oh, my God. <laughs> you should see it now. It's, he's, like, he's taking on a whole persona now. It's yeah. kind of hilarious. Like, he wants to start streaming, but I just, you know, that video game world is its own thing. And I'm not sure I want the world to see that side of Cash. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. 
It's it's crazy. You know, and it's like and it's literally its own world. Like have you have you ever? Well, I'm sure my you son have. plays. He, he did the he does the Fortnite thing here and there, but he's kind of past that. He he found a group of friends playing Fortnite. Yeah. That he literally just gets online with, and they'll play all separate games, but they talk. On, yeah, that's cash. Cash yeah. is the same thing. But have you ever just listened to their conversations? I try not to. Yeah, don't. It's their own world. Yeah. Like anything and everything that I want to go in there. Not, you can't say that. You can't say that. Wait a second. Every single thing you can't say yeah. in in the world is said in the video game world. Yeah. It is insanity there. Yeah. Insanity. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. Oh, it's, it's crazy. So what do you got coming up? Like as far as like any other than the documentary, do you have any like appearances, uh, projects? Like what's what's the first quarter of 2023 look like for you? Well, uh, getting the... Four. Oh, yeah, Sorry. I'm still on like three, two. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still on three. I'm like this next year, and I'm like, oh, wait, we're already in 24. Yeah. But um, the book, the release of That's the right, book, yeah. um, getting the Mustang done, the of course, the sculptures or whatever, continuing on my my waiting list. But um, the Mustang is a big deal. Uh, the Mach 1, I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, I bought yeah. a Mach 1 Mustang. So I sold the truck, the cut up one, and bought this. And so I'm going to cut this up and actually turn it into a running and driving uh, machine. But just building the resume on that mm. because, like I said, I'm after Mattel. I'm ready. I want a Hot Wheels car. Mm. Like, I want a Hot Wheels car that eventually is going to put me in a meeting to get a Barbie. And it's not a Ray Ripple Barbie. It's a, like trades. Like, we need a welder Barbie. We need a, we need like a concrete yeah. Barbie. We need a roofing Barbie. Like, we need uh, Barbies that are in the trades, not just steam, because we do have so many women in the trades now, yeah. especially single moms that are struggling. We get into the trades because we need more money. And, I think those inner children yeah. of those women deserve something like that. And so I feel like mm -hmm. my best avenue to approach that is through what I know best yeah. and what I'm great at. And that's the cars and like, you know, doing that. And so I think yeah, it'll kind of that's the next that's the next thing I'm trying. I'm after it. I'm after it. And I tell everybody because I'm manifesting it so hard because they fucked up and answered a couple of emails. Yeah. You know, and so I haven't got that meeting yet, but I'm on the track and it's going to happen. And that's so, cool. like, I, I want to push that so much. And plus being, you know, a woman in the industry, I let responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. I want to give that back to the next generation. To I want to normalize women. it. Make it a normal thing, yeah. not like, oh, it's a woman doing this. Yep. It's like, no, it, it, just get past that, like, situation of, you yeah. know, uh, this person is doing it, right, yeah. you know? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be, it's coming, you know what it's I mean? It's coming. I'm it's telling not, you, that's what I'm saying. Like, this year, I just feel like there's a line. Yeah. I'm going to cross, and it's never going to be the same. My life is never going to be the same again. Not in a bad way, in, like, the best way possible, because, like, I've just... I want it and what I want I get and it's because not just in a cocky way but because like if you don't if you don't want something bad enough to go after it then is it yeah. even worth it at that point you know and so like I push and I'm gonna get it so you just yeah we'll see a we'll couple watch. years a couple of years it'll be there so I gotta I got some weird connections in the universe that has like, kind of led me to that point and I've been after Mattel for about two years now two and a half years and so Mattel, just know I'm coming for you. But um, I got a lot of uh, signs from the universe, you know, mm -hmm. and that and people that have been put in my path mm -hmm. that are going to help me make that happen. So I'm just going to keep pushing, keep working, keep being patient, keep giving. So yeah. that way it'll come back and it'll my moment will come. It'll yeah. come. Yeah, for sure. It'll come. <clears throat> well, I really appreciate this. This has been fun. Like and eye opening. Yeah. You know, and I think that you got some cool shit coming out this year. And on that that line you're talking about, it's going to be interesting for not just myself, but like all the people that listen to this to see and wait for this thing that, you know, transpire. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See it all come together. And, you know, oh, man, like, you know, two years from now, a year from now, five years from now. And then all of a sudden there's this Barbie coming out and then someone's going to be like, man, I remember talking I remember about that on podcast. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Like, I'm it's I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. I'm going to make it happen. And. If not, I'm gonna die trying. Basically, yeah. we're gonna fifty we cent and <laughs> get rich die trying type thing. You know, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna die trying to make this happen for yeah, that'd be cool, man. For those kids, you know, I think like I said, it's the kids, it's the meat and potatoes like of everything I do, and 
I do it all for that next generation, you know? Yeah. And that next generation can help you stay relevant because you're doing something for them and they remember that. So if you're only doing stuff for the 50 year old and up class. Yeah. The uh, Facebooks. Yeah. <laughs> all the Facebooks. All the boomers, you know. All the boomers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate you doing this and making the time to slop through, stop oh. through here, not slop through here. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, stoked for you, man. Yeah. Thank so. you for having me. I'm, I, this is, like, one of my favorites podcasts. Anyways, oh, yeah, thank so. you. You don't have course. to say that. No, I'm being serious. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did, I just finished the Austin oh, podcast. Oh, awesome. I haven't, yeah, the one that you just posted yesterday, oh, I think. Oh, uh, so Schultz. Taylor Schultz. That was a good one. We talked a little bit of industry, yeah, like, pain industry. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of his. Yeah, he's, a, he's a nice fan. dude. Yeah, a huge fan of his. He's, he's, he's doing a lot for, I think, us as custom painters. Like, really? he's, it's like that point you know, I guess since we're talking about it, I'll, I'll extend this one just a minute. But he's doing for some of us in the custom paint world, we get to this point of our career where it's either a you just keep painting bikes the rest of your life, or you start to become part of the industry to make it a better industry for the people coming up. Yeah. And I, as a painter, leaned more into motorcycles because I couldn't quite get any traction with brands and paint world. So that's why my brand looks way more like a motorcycle based brand than a custom paint brand. Yeah. Schultz, who is also very heavy in the motorcycle world, is the opposite. And he's creating paint right now for us that is designed for us because automotive paint is designed for automotive stuff yeah. in different applications. And over the years, they've been removing things out of the paint to make it more cost effective for them, but also more expensive as the rising cost of it. And it makes our jobs harder because they're taking out things that make the paint workable. Yeah. So things that like make the paint stick to the layers below it. Yeah. So when you start taping over it, it rips it out because it's not, it doesn't have binders and certain, uh, you know, other chemicals within it, you know? Yeah. So they're developing a whole paint brand with the quality stuff. And in order to make it still cost friendly, they're cutting out all those layers of middlemen that literally just add another 30%, another 40% yeah. on top of the original cost to where, you know, three different companies touch this can of paint before it touches my shop. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see like our generation start to make changes instead of just accept that the way things have always been is the way things are, yep. you know? And I think what he's going to be doing with that world, what you've been doing as a part of like women moving into the trades, um, which uh, like I said, it's always been a thing, but it's not now it's like, it's more like people seeing you do it on social media gives them the idea to get into it. It's normalized. Yeah. It's Otherwise you just thing. have to know a chick that works in here. And if you're a chick, you see that and you're like, Oh shit. Like I didn't know I could do that. And then yeah. bam. So now seeing it out there in the world is, is I think just opening the doors for more people to do it. So in a way you're changing the narratives in which we grew up with. And in a way, like I, I, I don't know that I've, I'm, I'm not trying to say anything I'm doing is on that cusp. I'm just doing, trying to, as like take trying to take some ownership of the motorcycle industry, you know, with doing a podcast or whatever the case may be, I just want to like make it better. Yeah. You know, like carry on positive people and try to weed out negativity and like, uh, you know, fuckery, if you will. Yeah. And, you know, like just make this a better place, you know, make events that have opportunities for people to grow and, and, and see shit like yeah. what you do or what I do or what, you know, a lot of people do in this industry that, you know, photographers, uh, you know, sculptors, painters, welders, you know, people that just do rad shit on a bike that have a great story. That's yeah. still art in my opinion, yeah. you know, danger Dan riding to the, you know, the bottom of South America. That's a story that I just wish I could help tell better. Yeah. You know, it's so. the art of noticing. I think once, uh, you notice things, everything becomes art and the, yeah. you know, the stories, the people, what they wear, the colors they wear, the bikes they ride, the things that are on their bikes, the stickers that are on their bikes, you yeah. know, the wear and tear on the tires, the story that the tires even tell, you know, the oil dripping on the ground, you know, everything that is an aspect of it is yeah. art and but in all ways of life, you know what I mean? Not yeah. just in the motorcycle world or you, or but in your house and your the way you carry yourself and the, what you drive and how have you, you... Have you watched that new series on HBO with uh, Jason Momoa yet? No. It's good. Is it? It's really good. I haven't watched it yet. The last two episodes that just came out on Thursday were like fucking hidden home. Really? Yeah, for especially for me <clears throat> and the 
motorcycle world. Like there was a, a narrative on the most recent episode that came out that was just like real heavy. And I, I've over this last year became friends with one of the guys on the show that, that was in the, in that motorcycle episode. And it was just cool to know him and know who he is and see him in that being that person. And, and, you know, it's like what that Momoa show is doing right now to me is kind of like what Jesse James did for with monster garage and kind of the biker build off or not that just helping usher in that it's like, it's cinematic, you know, videography about different types of trades from photography to knife making to, um, you know, just these motors, these old choppers and, and like, I'm in love with it. And I, and I've gotten a chance to meet some of the people and interview them that we haven't released yet that are helping film all this stuff and make these kind of things. And like I said, I'm just trying to surround myself with these people that are doing cool shit because it makes me want to do cooler shit. Yeah. You, you know are I mean? who you hang out with. Yeah. You yeah. are who you hang out with. And if you hang out with millionaires, you're going to have the millionaire mindset. That's the only way to put that. And like yeah. you, you hang out with artists, you're going to have an artist mindset. You hang out with people who are partying, you're going to have a party mindset. You know, you hang out with like-minded people for what you want in your future. Mm -hmm. Like where you see yourself is who you need to hang out with. Yeah. You know what I mean? In the future. Yeah. Like every, even like every aspect, every aspect, even down to like your spouse or like their friends and things like that. It really matters and it really puts you in a, in, you know, a different headspace if you don't take care. Like yeah, make yeah. sure that like all of that is exactly where you're headed, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I've always felt like that, you know, like definitely like putting yourself in a position to, you know, gain um, you know, more, perf more perspectives, more inspirations and things like that. I just always, you know, I, I always try to say this, like, I also try to keep in mind, like who I am for somebody below, like not below me, like any the kind of way. Responsibility for what the, you like, have, this life. You there's get. somebody that's trying to get in my circle because they want to learn what I know how to do yeah. or whatever. And I'm looking at the world only trying not to be so self-centered that I'm just doing everything for me and not realizing that through a podcast, it's like showing people different, you know, things or the things we create here in Dallas, our events that we put on, like just to create an opportunity for people to come and be around and absorb what we put out. Yeah. Even though I'm looking for that guy over there doing this, I know that I have an obligation to also do this for certain people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. I feel it. I feel it. It's like what you said about, uh, early on about, um, like what you, the message you put out and how it affects people you know, good or bad and same concept, you yeah, know? You, I mean, you have a grave responsibility for the position that you're in to, to be able, like, I mean, this life chose you, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like when you put on the magic glasses, you yeah. have to see the world through those magic glasses. And if you take them off, I mean, you, you can't take them off again, you know, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, so you put on the magic glasses and now you're here and you have to like what you do with that is like a, you know, a hero versus villain type situation. Like you can yeah. use it for good or you can use it for bad. And I think a lot of people fall in love with the numbers and the rush it gives you to have the views and the numbers and stuff like that. And that's when, you know, what we talked about the last po podcast, they build this following and then they turn to other things because they need that. They just have to have that validation. Yeah. You know, they need that. They crave that. It's a dopamine, you know, in yep. their brain release that they need that. And like what you're doing is good. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? What you're creating and what you're projecting is good. And you've taken that responsibility and you're using it for the hero aspect versus the villain aspect, you know? So. Sometimes I want to be a villain. Hey, I, I have like a, I'm like secretly in love with like these people that are like crimes and like, you know, like not, there was like a, what was that, that sheriff's deputy that got that guy that was on death row or he had a life sentence. She helped him escape from jail. And then oh. you remember that? Uh, yeah, I think I remember a little bit of that. I was so rooting for them. Like, I'm like not even lying. Like, that part of me is like, because I'm in love with Bonnie and, Clyde, Bonnie and Clyde, you know? Yeah. And so, like, I was so rooting for them. And then they, like, screwed it all up. They could have been in Mexico way deep at the very bottom. And yeah. nobody would have ever found them. But, you know, <laughs> he had to wash his car that day, you know? <laughs> so, but yeah. yeah, I'm in love with all all that lifestyle, you know, that villain, well, that the villain lifestyle. I don't want to murder people by any outlaw. means. But yeah, the outlaw of just like not caring cuz sometimes I care too much and I just wish I didn't care in yeah, a sense, yeah. you know, and so 
There's yeah. that. Yeah, there's for sure that. All right. All right, we're done. We can yeah, do this we all day. Done. <laughs> we're all right, done. Good. Well, thank you, Ray. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you for having and, me. And uh, have a safe drive back. Yes. And yes. hopefully we'll have some sun in Texas. Yeah, soon, hopefully. Maybe the sun's out now. I don't know yet. It's not. That's it's not. not. <laughs> it's not.